the 7,383 seat strategy is also is obviously a a somewhat tongue tongue in cheek nod to the old 50 state um, Howard Dean strategy, uh, but it uh, it's tongue in cheek. But in a way, it's not it's not quite tongue in cheek, is it? No, it's not, uh, Sam. You know, it's really looking at how Democrats on some level gave up contesting a lot of state legislative seats. I mean, it it refers to the number of state legislative seats in bodies uh, across the country. Uh, And it really looks at the way Democrats gave up uh, starting in 2009 for a lot of complicated reasons. Uh, Republicans dug in and uh, they wound up flipping these states from being uh, being bodies that were dominated by Democrats. Uh, you know, even Ronald Reagan took the White House. George W. Bush took the White House. Uh, but the state legislature stayed Democratic. And, uh, you know, in 2008, 2009, folks, Republican folks figured out that there was a lot of power at that level and that they could use it for redistricting. They could use it to uh, pass really regressive laws on abortion and taxes and uh, voter suppression and everything else. Uh at the same time as uh, Barack Obama took the White House and Democrats felt like, OK, the power uh, is in Washington. So it's a it's been a it's been a tough 10 years. But in the last two or three years, a lot of uh, grassroots people and even some more more uh, elite folks uh, have realized Democrats have to get back into the game. All right. Let's I mean, let's talk briefly about why. Why? I mean, what happened? I mean, what I mean, I, I think and, you know, we can. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on the gerrymandering follow, following the 2010 election. And in fact, this week uh, there was a report put out by the Brennan Center to that um, really brings it to stark relief. The um, the gerrymander gap, for lack of a better term, that uh, Democrats need to overcome. We'll touch on that in a second. But but what was the what, what were the circumstances? Obviously, there's a lot of different things. But what, what was the broad, I guess, sensibility that allowed for these, and I think uh, over the Obama administration, there was some, you know people cite a thousand seats lost. What what, what led to that? I think, in large measure, uh, it was people uh, all the so much energy going into uh, certainly the Obama race and and into you know Senate campaigns, taking back the House, good things basically. Uh, but disinvesting at the state level, kind of taking it for granted. And, you know, mediocre Democrats who hadn't had a challenger uh, for 10 years suddenly had had challengers. And, uh, you know, everyone from the Kochs to Art Pope in North Carolina, were, they were putting millions and millions of dollars into these into these state legislative races, which honestly, especially back then, but even to some extent now, uh, you know, a, a, a twenty thousand, a fifty thousand dollar investment uh, could could flip a seat. Uh, they're 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 not uh, they're not nearly as expensive as say a congressional district. And so uh, Republicans got got smart about it, and and Democrats got dumb. I mean, it's not really you know we 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 can you, you alluded to the fifty stri- fifty state strategy, and we know that you know Howard King kind of got rewarded for his efforts. Uh, by losing his job at the DNC and, uh, you know, but it's, it's not really the, a job of the DNC. It's kind of, it's kind of a, it's a weird, it's a weird nether region. You know, there was a, there is the democratic legislative campaign committee that lost some powerful staff. Um, it just wasn't where it wasn't where the action was. And suddenly it, for, for Republicans, it absolutely was. And so, uh, those, uh, those millions of dollars that came pouring in from the Koch brothers and others, like you say, uh, turned the balance of the state houses. And then in 2010, the, uh, Republicans, and, uh, we certainly have talked about it on this program. Uh, David Daly has a uh, book about, uh, this process. Um, and the Brennan center, like I said, came out with a report this week on gerrymandering, which suggests that Democrats need to, and different people have different numbers, Nate Smith has others, but uh, clearly the Democrats need to win by somewhere between 7 and 12 uh, percentage points just to get to a 50-50 type of situation. I mean, this is... This is bizarre and sometimes hard for people to wrap their heads around, but the Democrats can go out and win 65% of the vote 
and still lose the majority of seats across the state houses because of the way that um, the, the the Republicans gerrymandered. So here is here is a sort of a, a, a broader question. Republicans clearly came in in 2010 and they had this agenda, right? Like we're going to we're going to take over these state houses. We're going to uh, redistrict in 2010, which they did. Uh, it's being reversed. It was so bad in Pennsylvania. It's being reversed by it was reversed by the state Supreme Court. But we see it perhaps uh, it is, uh, the Supreme Court in the United States may in fact reverse some of these. Uh, but we're also going to pass all sorts of legislation, whether it's right to work, which ends up dropping Democratic vote tattle, t- tallies by two to three percent or other mechanism to enhance our power. Right. Before we get to target like, the public target public employee unions, they are, you know, they remain a huge source of Democratic money as well as uh, foot soldiers uh, on campaigns. Really incredibly smart, devastating, brutal move. And, and National Democrats did so little to fight back. Uh, you know, most not- notably in, in Wisconsin, but elsewhere as well. Right. And we're on the verge of seeing that on a national level with this Janus case. But wh- let me ask right. you this, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but do you think Democrats understand this part of it? Because clearly there's a phenomenon. I want to get to this phenomenon of what's going on on these state races in terms of involvement, both institutional and grassroots on these races. But do you also think in, in the course of your reporting, did you get a sense that there's an awareness that if if the Democrats take power, they need to have on their agenda a an issue like a set of policies that will enhance their ability to get reelected, like expanding voting rights, like expanding right. the rights to uh, unionize. I mean, I'm not saying they should do anything nefarious, but do you think there's that awareness this time around? I don't, uh, you know, I think it's increasing, but I don't know if it's where you and I would, would want it to be. I mean, I do, you know, Eric, Eric Holder has this, this fancy group uh, that's getting a lot of press, but it is important because it shows that smart Democrats with a lot of money kind of get this, that, the you know, they're, they're focusing uh, certainly on state legislative races, but they also have a, a you know, court strategy. Um, they're suing, in fact, you know, to block this this new census rule question asking about citizenship. That's it's not exactly what we're talking about, but they're looking at the various ways uh, Republicans are trying to basically choose their voters rather than voters choosing their representatives. So, you know, I, I think an increasing number of of people at that level get it. But I also think, you know, honestly, they were led to some extent by the grassroots and the incredible progress that happened in Virginia last year, which was, you know, women largely coming back from women's marches and, and you know, whether they had worked for Bernie or Hillary, I, I, I saw in Virginia an incredible overlap. You know, you and I are, are veterans of that, you know, not very fun 2016 primary race. But on the ground in Virginia, you saw these women who'd worked for both campaigns, in fact, uh, come out of that awful election and decide they were going to run for something, and it wasn't going to be, you know, dog catcher or school board. That they would look at the they would look at the House of Delegates, uh, and so you wound up more than doubling the number of Democrats who challenged Republicans. I mean, the thing that's happening is that Democrats aren't even challenging Republicans at the state assembly and state sem- senate level, and in the red and purple states, these guys and their guys uh, are, are going unopposed. But I, I do feel like the grassroots led the way in showing um, what a difference uh, good candidates, diverse candidates, and really angry, you know, motivated people, especially women and people of color, could make at the state legislative level. They wound up taking, uh, they took 15 seats. They almost took control of the legislature. Uh, it came down to literally picking a name, a tie where they picked the name out of a, uh, a ceramic bowl. Uh, and so I, I really do think this is a case of the grassroots uh, kind of reminding well, elites. Well, let's take possible. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk more about that, because uh, this is a, a fascinating phenomenon. And we're uh, hearing about this. These stories are starting to bubble up. And I want to talk uh, more deeply about it and get a sense of 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 where you uh, of what's next. Uh, but we will be right back. I'm talking to Joan Walsh. Uh, and on her piece from The Nation magazine, the 7,383-seat strategy, I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio. <laughs> 